now. It's time for the College of Ice with Brian Brosdahl and Steve Panan. Hey everybody, welcome to College of Ice. Thanks for joining us again tonight. You know, we're going to go to two shows per week starting next week. Uh, this Wednesday, we're going to be actually on the road. But after that, it's going to be every Sunday night and every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central. So uh, it's pretty awesome. Hey, I want to bring Brian Brosdahl in here right away. Bro, I know uh, you're in the land of making ice right now. And how you been the last week? Oh, man, I'm telling you what. It start all the morning and you've got ice. And then when the wind starts blowing, it's gone. <laughs> I mean, it shreds it right up to shore. It's been 20, 30 mile an hour winds. I've never, <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. Have you? No, no. You know, it's a tease though, because the water's cold enough and it's going to happen really fast. So I, uh, the good news is if you could turn down the wind just a little bit, just turn that dial down. We're going to be making some really good ice everywhere. Driving home today, it was blowing 30 from the west, and the, the truck was kind of going, <laughs> coming back. So, hey, Michelle Maury, great to see you. Hey, we had a big winner of the Freeville Prize Pack last week, and uh, I wanted to congratulate Anthony Meadows. You know what he told me, bro, is he said he was so thrilled about it because his kids, he told his kids if he won, the kids were going to get part of the prize pack. So, he, we, not, we, not, we didn't have just one happy camper this week. We had four. And the good news is everybody listening tonight has a shot at winning that same prize pack, including this College of Ice, the College of Ice mug right here that you can use for whatever types of drinks that you're doing. But, hey, bro, how do people enter this contest tonight? Hey, it's simple. All you got to do is comment, like, and share this episode, and you know, drop us your questions during the show, and you're in to win. We really want to get you guys involved in the show. So if you have questions or comments, one of the things I'd like to hear is if ice is starting to form where you guys live, let us know what's happening because uh, we want to share information across uh, across the ice belt about what's going on. And it's very cool. John, it's, it's great to see you here. Hey, Good bro. Here. Hey, bro. One of the hey. things that I wanted to ask you about is knots. Which knots are you using on the ice most of the often? And, and which and, and why are you using them? Hey, Justin and Jeff. Uh, I like to use the uh, Palomar knot, you know, because it's strong. But uh, my favorites are probably the improved clinch because I could tie it with my eyes closed and I could tie it in any conditions. And, you know, as far as braid uh, fluorocarbon, then I'll use the back to back uni. And I know the Albright stronger. But when my fingers are like sausages, I can't tie <laughs> like a monkey in a football, right? I just can't do it. And so I like simple knots. And then loop knot is one of my favorites because it gets the the bait to, to, to move a little bit. And, yeah. you know, it's not – we you didn't have it on knot wars or anything, and maybe it breaks easy. Just such a drag light. You get a lot of action. Just don't pull too hard. <laughs> you know, it's funny, bro. When we were doing knot wars years back, we'd tie – I mean, literally thousands of knots, and you start seeing trends. A couple things yes. that stood out with mono is if you have a, a knot that's not real strong, a lot of times when they're building mono, they don't get it. You know, you've got portions of the line that are stronger and less strong. There's, it almost fluctuates through, so break off a few feet and retie. But the other thing is I learned that if you go through the hook eye twice on most knots, you're going to see about a 10 to 12% jump. In, in line strength and not strength. And that's pretty, that's pretty impressive on, on some of the lighter lines. Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, if you can improve it a little bit, especially if you're in a competition or you're in a little tournament or whatever, or if you're fishing a, a trophy lake that has big fish, you want to make every knot count. So, but if I'm done doing two, two, 25 knots, 50 knots a day, I, I'm probably not going to do that. You know, I'm in the same boat, though. If a knot isn't really easy to tie, it's different than sitting at home and, and practicing a knot. But when you're out in the boat or on the ice and your hands aren't working, it, the, the conditions, the winds are blowing and things like that, it can be a little tough to tie. And it actually makes it easier not to go that route. So, and then have you tried other line-to-line -line knots before? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> there's, there's so many. And I've actually followed that knot wars. 
And uh, I, I always liked it because it, my picture is in every one of them. If you look at all of them, I'm holding a walleye in the background for Frabel. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm going to check yeah, well, when I get all that. You know, not that I'm watching or anything, but uh, but I, I, you know, I really was surprised at uh, uh, how how there was ties in in these knots, and and it was very interesting. But I'm, I'm a creature of habits, and I've actually used the improved clinch, but I have one little cadence that I do different: the last loop twice to keep from slippage. So that's kind of my little experimental knot, and sometimes an extra loop. But I know two loops through the hook eye. Yeah. definitely increases your chances like we had talked earlier. Especially with braid. A lot of times braid, everybody grew up fishing monofilament, at least uh, from your generation and mine, where everybody's used to fishing monofilament. So when braid came out and actually fluoro, we really had to retie, uh, learn how to retie knots because you could, if you didn't wet a knot with fluoro, you're going to burn the line, you can break it. And, uh, and, and braid, obviously very slippery too as well. Absolutely, I agree. And there's a lot of times with really light line one, two, three pound test, you can't take that risk. You can't do it with even four or five pound test. And I tend to use lighter line when I'm fishing walleyes. So, hey, Daryl, how you doing? Yeah. So it, it's all about making sure and and like you say, moisten it so you don't burn the line. So one thing to remember when you're doing a line to line knot, most of the times the knots are going to break at below the knot strength. So you're looking at about a 15 to 20% reduction uh, with like the uni to uni knot. But on most good knots, if a line has got a rated strength of say 10 pound test, you're probably gonna find knots that are gonna break in that 13 to 15 pound range if it's a good knot. So that keep, kind of keep that stuff in mind as you're, as you're pulling forward. Hey bro, we got some really awesome guests today uh, coming in. Uh, one is Colt Ringer, uh, he's with, uh, Aquaview, and uh, he's a new owner of the company, but he, they got some exciting new products. We also have uh, Kyle Swords, and he's a Fraybill Pro coming out of Wisconsin, which will be fun. And then we've got a, a buyer for Fleet Farm who's been with the uh, company and buying tackle for us ice anglers for probably two decades now. Um, and uh, Brian Sticka, so it should be fun to really talk to these guys a little bit more. But so talk about ice conditions around home. How are things, uh, how are things shaping up around home? I know the wind has been a problem, but, uh, you know, where are you at with ice? Well, all we need is if things to freeze, but now remember the shallow pond swamps are froze over and, you know, the duck lakes are froze over. And I noticed there's a zillion ducks around right now, but they're, they're going to the open water, but, uh, the, the stuff you want to fish isn't froze. And, and that the wind is really ripping it apart, but anything with deep water is not quite there. But uh, the water temperature cooled down finally after that big warm up we had. So, and I, I'm hearing the same all over the place. It the w water peaked up real high and then it, it's dropping back down. So it's going to freeze really fast once once we get stable calm weather. So, have you had a chance to get your gear ready for this winter? I mean, what what is your process for getting augers and rods and everything set up uh, for the ice? Well, I, you know, I try to put on new line for sure and, uh, and just go through everything uh, and, and make sure that everything's up to date. You don't want to use old uh, mono or fluorocarbon, but, you know, sometimes braid, you can strip a little off because braid is super strong. But um, just check, you know, put some sub-zero lubricant on your, uh, you know, so, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I do that too, sometimes for s small ones, real micro stuff. But, uh, you know, Frable has sub-zero lubricant and, it, what it does keeps your reel moving without any it not being sluggish you know you want it to be smooth in cold condition you take a, a high-end reel off the counter for summertime and you bring it to winter they, they barely move you know so very important so uh you go through and check the grease so you don't have real thick grease in there and then for the most part i like to pack up an emergency pack of gear and i have all my I got my edge boxes because we get a lot of micro pulverized snow that gets in our tackle box. So edge, the edge boxes are full and ready to go. That's awesome. So what's your favorite fish story? I know you've got oh. a zillion of them, but is there one that stands out? Let me take a deep breath. There's so many. <laughs> stories, but I okay. gotta say, one of my favorite stories is I took the office crew of North American fishermen out one time and it was minus 30 below. And yeah. it was 20 mile an hour winds and yeah. they bring some of their friends and they had some guys from Missouri there. They thought they were crazy at first just to go with that. And they, they, 
I opened up the zipper of their tent to ask them how they're doing because it was sideways snow and nasty. And they're like, how do we get out of here? We want to leave. <laughs> I'm like, we want to leave for it. You know, the fish were biting and, and, and I stuck my head in there and it was just dripping in there and they were shivering and all, all their lines were frozen. And I said, guys, you got to come over here. And so that's when the Frabel Artec first came out, the insulated houses. And they came to my house. It was dry in there. You could put your fingers on the ceiling, no condensation and warm. And I said, have at it. And they had a blast. The fish were biting so good because we had a stable buildup in pressure. And then it was falling fast. And the wind was going nuts. And the fish, we caught largemouth bass, walleyes, lots of 10-inch to 11-inch bluegills, two pound oh, pound yeah. bluegills. Yeah. 15 inch crappies in a spot that's mainly perch and a few bluegills. It just went nuts. And I remember it was so nasty out that the, the, the trail filled in and actually my dog got out. He likes to run ahead of the truck and I just followed the dog and he knew exactly where those tire prints, it was just white. I don't know how he could find it, but you know, using, using the dog to find your way off is uh, sometimes <laughs> probably not as accurate as, as, as GPS, but pre, was, pre GPS. So an interesting thing about that story is, uh, is you're one of the first guys I've ever talked to that really considered panfish to be of trophy size. So if a fish was 10-inch bluegill or a 14-inch, 15-inch, 16-inch crappie, those are fish that you've been historically releasing. And I think it's time for most anglers to consider that as well because we put a lot of pressure on these big fish and we want those genetics to stay in the lake. Well, as we're becoming real educated and technology and everything, it's it's not about catching them because we're going to catch them. Uh, it's it's what do you want to catch? And, you know, a, a nine inch bluegill is too big. Anything under nine, the fair game. But for a fork full of meat, I'm not going to wreck the lake. And so I personally won't keep a fish over nine and a lot of people. But, you know, the uh, the, the DNR's got a, a, a bluegill uh, board that's coming up that's going to start looking at lakes. And uh, uh, that, that committee is actually going to make some leaps and bounds to help on, on saving some of them. Now, I'm not saying raining on anybody's fish fry if you like to keep a lot of fish. But let's have some lakes. Come on. For the future, for kids, let's have some lakes that we protect the trophies. And we know that if you take big bluegills out, that the lakes can stunt and it's just not good. And take your kids fishing someday to experience what we got to see, the big bluegills. And I've been passionate about it since I was a kid. My dad taught me it. And we we're odd ducks in that way, but I'm still talking about it today. And uh, I think that uh, it's it's about, you know, letting go of them. And it's not that hard to let go of them. You just got to slap your friend's hand if they grab it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, bro, did I ever tell you the story? I had a chance to fish in the World Ice Championships years ago in Finland. Oh, cool. And we, and, and we got off the plane, and, and we had some local hosts to kind of show us the, the body of water and, and show us what tackle they're using. You know, we're fishing similar species, a, a perch, uh, a European perch over there, and a white fish and things like that. But I got to show you, Kai, call up the photo of these rods, these little palm rods. I don't know if you've ever seen these, bro. Yes. But, uh, yeah, so the one on the bottom was one I, I got from a Russian fisherman. The one in the middle was one that our Finnish guest gave us, and the one on top is uh, another one that was uh, real lightweight. But I got to show you how to reel this thing. Kai, go ahead. This is how you. This is how small this thing is. I mean, here my hand covers it, and this is how you reel it like this. It was super for super lightweight fish. I'll tell you what. In my, we had a, a section in there. And I, there was a, an angler, a Russian angler that was catching fish because he wasn't moving. And I looked over and he was catching. He had 38 fish, weighed 83 grams. And he took first place in the section. And he was catching some things. But look at, the, look at some of the baits that we're using. Uh, Kai, call this up. This bait in the lower, the, the lower right, that's a size 12 hook, a number five tungsten. Oh, my. Look at the size that bait up top is probably 20 times smaller. That's a size, uh, I think it was a 28 or a 24. And you'll notice that all three of the baits had holes through the middle. So you actually run your line through the through sure. the bait and then back up and tie, uh, tie onto the shank of the hook and on that sort of thing. But, hey, we got Colt Ringer in, uh, in the uh, queue. Uh, why don't we bring him in right away? He's the owner of Aquaview Cameras. Colt, good to there see you, man. How are how you doing? Good. How are you guys? Hey, we're good. doing good. So, uh, Colt, you've got a 
a quite a varied background. You're an entrepreneur, used to teach uh, and and all that. But I, the one thing that's constant is you're a, a very avid, passionate angler, especially with your kids. And it's kind of fun to watch. Yeah. And I, like I said, it's, it's been a great opportunity and a, a long road and met a lot of great people and happy to be in this position with a great company and just surrounded by good people again, too. That's awesome. So I know you got some exciting new products coming out like the quad cam and we're going to talk about those in a minute. But I wanted to ask both you and bro, what when do you guys go to cameras uh, underwater viewing and, and what really have you learned? I guess, Colt, I'd like to start with you on that. Yeah, I was going to say, I've been using uh, an underwater camera since I started, I, well, 20, 25 years ago when they first kind of came uh, onto the market and I've had them all. And it's amazing how much I've learned over the time. So I've been a passionate user for, you know, and viewing underwater footage. I, I just love it. I love going out and turning on, uh, you know, especially now hooking up the cameras to the big screen TVs and the fish houses and watching just the fish behavior, yeah. the reactions. I mean, there's just tons of stuff that I think the biggest thing I've learned the last couple of years is that fish will eat a lot of dead bait off the bottom. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, that, that's uh, actually true. You know, was, it's yeah. amazing. So bro, I know you use cameras probably daily. Uh, when, what situations are you using cameras mostly and, and which models are your favorites? Well, I like to use the uh, HD7, which is true HD, but it comes with all the attachments like like this fin. So in open water, I could I can go pretty fast, and it doesn't shake, and you can see a long way. So I could see what's down there. I could see if they're walleyes or other fish. And then in the winter time, I absolutely love the Micro Revolution Pro, and and the reason I do is because you know I got this micro camera to spy on the fish they're, they're less afraid of it and then you can pull it off and reel it in like a reel you don't get wet fingers it's super high tech it's like spy gadgetry but it's also got a magnetic charger like a cell phone this thing fits in your pocket it, this little tiny thing's powerful but you don't have to carry it around you can wear it around you just put it in this bag here hands-free fishing you know that's the thing i like about it is you could fish and go from hole to hole and you don't stop till you see fish. You drop the camera down. If you see fish, you stay. And then maybe put it in down view and watch them. And bluegill like to come in and just grab it. They don't quite have the hook. Wait a second. And they swallow it. Then you set the hook. That's the whole thing is you see what's down there and you catch them. So, Colt, not only has camera technology really approved, especially the light drawing and, and the, the, you know, the number of pixels on the camera and going from, say, 720 to 1080, true 1080, um, the lakes themselves are clearing uh, uh, with zebra mussels and pollution control. So this is really the dawn of a, an exciting time for underwater viewing because you've got great technology paired with clearer lakes. And I've used Aquaview down as deep as 50, even 60 feet of water. And to be able to actually see that far down is extraordinary. Yeah. And I think, like I said, coming into it, being the new owner, the the, the innovation that with the technology and the improvement along with the clarity of the water has been something that we're really excited to continue to build on and, and grow. And, you know, there's just a, a lot more opportunities out there too. And like I said, it's been, a, it's been a, a, we've got a great team um, that's working on, you know, the next generation of cameras as well as we speak. And it's just, uh, it's been, it's been fun and it's only going to get, uh, only going to get better. Talk to us a little bit about the quad cam. Explain what it is. We have a photo here that we're going to share with the group, but uh, explain what's what's behind the, the entire thing and, and, you know, really what led to this development. Yeah, this is exciting technology. And like I said, with all the new sonar electronics, this is kind of our new one for the underwater camera. So it's, it's a quad camera. It's got four cameras built in um, so that you get a, you know, almost a 360 view of cameras with the this is a 720 hd picture quality of so you've got a full circle of where the fish are coming from what they're doing um you know we've got our mopod and everything for the the current cameras this one you're going to be able to drop down and see everything that's coming around you without having yeah. to spin or move the camera so we're super excited it's got so if you see something coming in because a lot of times you'll see a pike coming in or a sunfish 
from one side. Yeah. You got the ability to touch zoom so that you can blow up that one quadrant. Wow. Just be able to view, you know, what's happening, you know, coming in from your east, west or whatever direction. So we're really excited. And then you can even touch zoom and zoom into that just like we have on our 10 HDI Pro feature. So we're so really looking forward to bringing that to the market. When, when is it coming to the market? Uh, we're getting our first batch, hopefully this week, uh, a very small shipment. And then the, the, the rest of them are, should be here the mid-December. So hopefully the wind will stop blowing and we'll be able to make the light. <laughs> And yeah. uh, it should be perfect timing for, for the, this season. You know, it's interesting. Bro was talking about how some cam, uh, camera might spook a fish or two, and he likes the micro for it. I was on an open water trip years back fishing smallmouth, and, I, and we were catching lots of largemouth but no smallmouth, and I couldn't figure out why. So I dropped the camera, and I was with, uh, with uh, a guy from Bassmaster. And, and, and I looked down, and I go, there's a three-pound smallmouth right there. And the camera slipped out of my hand, hit the bottom, and I and I threw up a big cloud of, of you know dust or whatever you want to call it. I pulled the camera up off the bottom, and that smallmouth was staring at the camera from about an inch away. And, and it was James Hall was with me, and he, James says, uh, "Did you see that?" I says, "Yeah, let's try it again." So I hit the bottom on purpose, pulled it up, and then there was two smallmouth, and then three, and then four. And uh, I said, you know what this means, James? He goes, yeah, I'm going to go to a one-ounce drop shot weight. <laughs> so, we, so we had fun. I've hey, actually had bass on those uh, in the past where uh, on the micro, I, you, you just see a bass coming up, and then all of a sudden it's gone, and you see tonsils, you see the gills. <laughs> and then next thing you know, the good thing about the revolution is you can unspool it and get ready because when they're running, it's like a tip-up. And I've <laughs> fought fish for a long time, and I'll tell you, the cord is really strong. And I've, I've fought two big bass one day on that camera, and they're not afraid of it. That It's actually an attractant. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah, we pretty we cool. see a lot of fish, especially panfish, too, will come in and check it out if you drop it, you know, in a hole and you're close to them. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they'll come and, I mean, sunfish will come and just nose right into it and pipe oh, yeah. them and bump it. And it, it's been, it's neat to see and neat to watch them do, you know, react when I, I was at Green Bay uh, over by Strohshine's place there, and, and, and you see a lot of deaf finders or people without deaf finders, I put the camera in the hole, and I only put it down a few inches below the ice, and I could see the water so clear. That's definitely a camera area, and I think they should be using them more because I could see what swam through. And no, everybody said there was lines, but you could see two walleyes and then a bunch of whitefish. So the moral of the story is you'll see more if you put it down, but you don't have to put it all the way down. You know, bro, you bring up a good point because the classic view for underwater viewing is like it's right over your shoulder, Colt. It's a side horizontal to bottom view. Mm -hmm. But there's times when viewing straight down is actually more efficient. And, you know, how many of the pros on the AquaView team, Colt, are, are using the down viewing technique? Uh, quite a few. And that's what's nice about that positioning fin. So you can, and, and a lot of them like that, get that camera almost to the bottom, set it on the bottom and have that. 45 degree going up so you know it's almost they're coming in up top their eyes are on top of their head it's another different angle you know that we've heard from a lot of our pros that they like uh, as well as the down viewing oh absolutely well especially late season a lot of times these fish will ride right up under the ice and actually up viewing is better for viewing fish than any other method it's uh, yeah. it's actually it's actually pretty deadly so what other new products do you have coming out that uh, you're excited about uh, that um, maybe you could share with the uh, with the guys uh, and the gals listening tonight. Sure, we, like I said, the quad is the one that's coming, and it's on. You know, should be in our warehouse mid December. We have a bite light that's coming as well. I think that's well. It looks like my TV shut off and my background behind me. I'm in my fish house watching footage from last year, but um, <laughs> we have a bite light coming that uh, that takes some of the, that snowstorm halo effect out as an accessory that's pretty exciting and we have a mobile recording device that we're really excited about that that hopefully will be here by january we're thinking so that's not really quite ready but it's just the ability to record and and share more of the underwater footage with your buddies and tease them when they're at work or, or when they're working from home i guess these days but 
Yeah. So, so if somebody wants to buy one of the quad cams, get one of the first ones that come out. Uh, what's is there a, a waiting list, or is there a, how how are you guys handling that side? That's of it? what we're just starting. So we're just building that page out. We've got a landing page built where you can enter your email address, and we'll have that up, and we can share that socially. But check our social feeds. We'll send that out, and it's we'll we'll send you an email when we're ready to. You know, we're confident we've got them, and we'll put yeah. them sale on our website and. Um, we'll know you that way, bro. I know you're number one on the list after Colton, and I'm number two. So there's there's whatever follows after that. I think was good. Oh, that's be great. Seeing that quad. Yeah, look forward to it. Well, Colt, hey, we really thank you coming by the College of Ice. Uh, you're closer to graduation than you were 15 <laughs> minutes ago. So thank you for stopping by and sharing the news. And uh, what is the website for uh, Aquaview so people can check it out? Yep, it's Aquaview. That's vu. dot com. Right on awesome. Bro's shirt there. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cole, so. thank you. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the show and good luck. And good luck to everybody out in the audience. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Cole. Bro, it's really amazing how Aquaview, I mean, the, the technology has changed so much in the last 20 years just for the light gathering and, and uh, you know, the water clarity and stuff. It's pretty amazing. So, hey, we've got in-house uh, Kyle Sorensen. He's a Frayville pro out of Wisconsin, and uh, I'd like to bring him in. He's a he's a, one of these guys that's super aggressive. Uh, What's going on, guys? Uh, how are you doing? I know you guys know each other real well. I think you've been on the ice together, haven't you? I've had oh, a lot. Yeah. That was yeah. a fun time, bro. How are you doing, Steve? Doing well. Doing well. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks hey, for having me. Hey, bro, I know you're you're really big on running and gunning and, and uh, you know, Kyle, I know you use it a lot on, on Winnebago. Talk a little bit about what is running and gunning, how do you use it, and, and uh, why do you use it on Bago so often? Yeah, you know, Bago is just a massive, massive body of water. The whole system as a whole, it really is. And uh, it's a big basin type, uh, you know, system that has – you know, real shallow flats uh, for the most part throughout the upper lakes, especially. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, constantly, constantly on the move, ripping holes, one here, one there, sometimes utilizing a grid technique to, uh, you know, eliminate water uh, to find an active school of fish. And uh, when we find one of these schools of fish, you know, sometimes we'll get lucky. And, uh, you know, the reason why we keep on going is because we're looking for the mega school. The mega school can have the walleyes, the white bass, crappies, perch, you name it, all mixed in there. And uh, you can have a very fun uh, fishing <laughs> adventure underneath uh, your ice hole, let me tell you. <laughs> so when you when you say you're ripping uh, ripping holes, how many holes are you cutting? Are you cutting them in a single file line or how, how, how you know, take me through that side of it. Well, it, it all depends. I mean, you know, uh, it, eliminating water is the key. So the most efficient way and the, the best way that you can go about and eliminate water is going to be the right, you know, uh, passage for that day. Maybe have multiple people with you uh, that can that can help, you know, eliminate that water and utilizing a grid technique and, you know, frog jumping or hopping over each other uh, definitely can work out. Or if you're by yourself, I mean, you know, you could just be throwing darts at a board at some days, you know, and uh, it's I, I'd be sitting here, uh, you know, joking with everyone if I said, you know, it only takes one hole to be successful. But sometimes you can rip 100 holes, you know, if not more uh, making long moves and whatnot uh, just to try to, you know, get one mark, you know, so. That's the Winnebago system, you know, as a whole right there. <laughs> it's shallower than, yeah. you know, it doesn't have any deep, deep holes. So the fish, there's no way to corner them. You just, they just go wherever they want. Exactly. And like you said uh, the other night, uh, bro, you know, just, you know, drilling holes, that, that that noise, you know, if you have multiple people in there, uh, you know, it, it or multiple holes being ripped, it can really spook fish. It really can. So, you know, hiding out in a shelter and, you know, being mobile is definitely key, especially on the Lake Winnebago system. Hey, hey, bro, I was going to ask you, you use running a gun a lot out of waters of water you're fishing, especially like leech and winnie and things like that. But that might be a little bit different approach than what Kyle's talking about. Kind of take me through that for you, for yourself. Well, it, it's important because it's big water. And a, a lot of times on Leech Lake, there's Kara flats. And Kara is a skeletal fragmented grass that doesn't have any roots. So it actually pillows up. 
and walleyes and perch will be in this stuff searching for crayfish because it holds them. And you could go past the car flat. So you got to remember there's only so much space you could fish. You just got to work those edges. So you drill, it might be a mile long, might be two miles long, but you can go past it. So we, you got to be mindful of that. Then on Winnie, massive mud flats, but they're holding to this little trench between two humps or this little saddle. And you'll find three fish here, three fish. And then over here, you'll find 10,000 and you back out of there. Like it's Noah's Ark, you know, and, and so they're, they're stuff like that. But the, the real thing is, is, is you find them, but you don't want to go past the areas. And so, and I see that all the time up here is everybody just drills to the other side and says, where are they? So Kyle, I know your, uh, your fish house choice is based really on mobility. Uh, which yep. house is the one that you're, which, which house are you using most often and why? Well, uh, going into this year here uh, with the new 115 that came out, I mean, this I this is like my ultimate shack here. I mean, uh, this one that uh, literally is, it's all a fixed pole design structure. Usually when I'm out, you know, hopping around, being mobile out there, running gunning, as we've been talking about, you know, speed is key. And being effective and efficient on the ice is the ultimate thing that you need. Uh, and uh, by having a fixed pole design like the 115, the Ice Hunter uh, 115, you're just popping it up, you know, get out of those conditions, you know, to, you know, take a little break, warm up a little bit, and then flipping it back down to continue on. You know, like I said before, you know, it'd be nice to rip one hole and, you know, have the flasher lit up like a Christmas tree, you know, uh, but uh, that usually doesn't happen. So sometimes after those long days, you know, being able just to flip up uh, the shack, not have to fumble around with any little uh, nubs or, you know, extenders or whatnot on those poles, uh, it really uh, helps uh, to be, like I said, effective and efficient. You know, nice thing too is a lot of times when you're in a fish house, nobody outside knows what you're catching. Yeah. Well, that's kind of fun as well. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. And uh -oh. uh, nah, pop back off there. Hopefully I came back on there. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, in terms of lures, I know you're a big fan of a lot of the horizontal baits. Uh, what uh, are you rigging them with live bait? Are you fishing them naked? And, uh, you know, what colors, what sizes are your favorites? You know, up here and, you know, I, I, I have a I, I rely greatly on my presentation, um, you know, and the, the bait selection. You know, the big thing uh, are swim baits, you know, the, the jig and wraps, uh, the puppet minnows and stuff like that. Huge. And 90 percent of the time I am 90, 95 percent of the time. I'm not using any type of live bait and I'm relying solely on my presentations. Like, like we were talking before, a real aggressive, aggressive presentation and a flurry flea give up is what I like to call the, the presentation uh, on these baits. But I always, always have plastics and especially spikes with me because, you know, if I have to switch to like a buckshot rattle spoon uh, or something like that, you know, I, I have that ability right there. And uh, that it doesn't just work on the Lake Winnebago system. It's it's a, a variety uh, of areas that I like these. But, uh, you know, I have my uh, Plano Edge, the 3600, just loaded full of jig and wraps and uh, spoons, uh, pimples too. Uh, you know, uh, pimples are awesome and uh, cast masters too. Just the whole gamut at the uh, ready uh, because you never know what these fish are going to want. And if you're on Lake Winnebago, especially, and you land on an active white bass school, I mean, those white bass, they will hit practically a piece of yarn if you move it right. Um, but uh, <laughs> getting at those, uh, you know, the, the jig and wraps and whatnot for those walleyes and trying to have that ability to, you know, have that scent, that uh, live bait at the ready. Sometimes, you know, is the difference between having a successful day and a not so successful day. <laughs> Bro, are you uh, a fan of live bait when you're fishing like the puppet minnow and things? I always bring live bait because uh, I, I, I got to produce fish every day. And so uh, I bring live bait and I bring a little bit of everything. And I got my Magnum bait stations. I've, I've got, uh, m you know, minnow heads already pre-cut in my pocket, even tails. Tails work sometimes. But uh, buckshot, rattle spoon, uh, rattle and puppet this year, a fire belly, uh, a, a buckshot uh, fire belly spoon is going to be really good. Worked last year, the prototypes. And, uh that's I'm that's what I'm running and gunning with most of the time, and I do catch fish on uh, spoons without any bait, and sometimes I catch them on the rattle and puppets without any bait. But most of the time, I have minnow heads ready to go. But sometimes I like to have a minnow down there swimming, and that's the important thing. And uh, you know, the right right action rods too, you know, is important. And and what do you use? What kind of rods do you use when you're out there most of the time running and gunning? Which frable rods? 
Oh, I totally, totally dig uh, anything in the 28 inch medium uh, category. You know, uh, I got this old, uh, you know, this old Frable. I mean, this thing yeah, has gone through, I don't know how many, how many fish here on the Lake Winnebago system over like almost maybe eight years, I'd say. Uh, and it just won't die. It just won't die. It's missing paint and everything on there. Okay. So, I mean, I, I have this with me every single time, but uh, you know, I've been using the Arctic Fire, a real cost efficient, uh, you know, uh, combo and stuff like that. Uh, last year, especially hooked in some really nice eyes on the uh, upper lakes around here in, uh, in the north woods of Wisconsin, you know, on top of it uh, and whatnot. And again, that 28 inch, you know, medium action for, you know, those number five jigging wraps uh, or the bigger spoons. And then, you know, even the medium lights, I, like, I have a sniper here, uh, a couple snipers that uh, have worked out great for the smaller uh, puppet minnows and, and uh, jigging wraps those number twos and whatnot and stuff like that so all in all i mean just having a bunch of combos at the ready is you know to switch up real quick is you know and having that that feel is uh you know something that i really like you know i got a quick question could you tell us about ob outdoors <laughs> old baby right the the old baby <laughs> and old baby uh that is uh where it's at right there you know uh i like to consider myself the lake winnebago systems free guide uh, out here. You know, anytime I'm out fishing, I don't do any actual guiding or anything like that. But anytime I'm out fishing, my cameras are with me, uh, you know, and I'm making videos, whether it's on that day's trip or the equipment that I'm utilizing. The last few days, last three days, and big shout out to, to my wife. She let me uh, play on the computer and we've got six videos at the ready going up to the YouTube channel. Uh, nice. So can't wait for that. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's just a, it's just a fun, uh, fun, I guess, working hobby, so to speak, right? <laughs> That's really great. So, bro, I was going to ask both of you guys, uh, is line choice, uh, what are you guys using with the, the horizontal baits in terms of the jigs? Are you using fluoro, mono, braid, combination of two? What What's your favorite? All, all fluoro. It's all fluoro in the wintertime for me because it, fluoro is the sink rate line. So I'm fishing straight up and down on fluoro. Braid, it's nice, but if you're outside – you know, it has it has uh, air pockets in it, so you can see it on your depth finder. It's kind of distracting, but it's it's really nice if you're inside, and uh, it does wake up water and freezes your eyes up. So you got to watch that. But braid is obviously really nice, you know. And uh, but fluorocarbon, fluorocarbon on almost everything. And if I'm on Winnebago, I'm using lighter rods than you because I'm fishing bluegills out there <laughs> and perch. And uh, that you know, we don't want to talk about the bluegills out there, but it, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, fluorocarbon, all my rods, 100% fluorocarbon on it. The only uh, thing that I add to them, depending on, you know, the, the size of lure that I'm running, uh, is just a barrel swivel mixed in, you know, on there to help with some line twists. At least with, you know, I've got a pretty aggressive hook set. I've known to uh, break a couple rods, but that one is still uh, surviving, let me tell you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that it's uh, it's definitely uh, fluorocarbon in my book between that four, maybe even six pound, you know, pushing up there, depending on, you know, how big the, uh, the lure is, you know. What's the average walleye size? Could I ask that uh, real quick here just to see? <laughs> I'd, I'd say, you know, right in the, the teens, you know, the, the upper teens would be uh, – mm -hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't say an average, but we've been getting a whole lot of different year classes and it's been fluctuating sure. quite a bit here. And especially this year uh, with the bait and the forage uh, going around in the systems uh, and whatnot, um, you know, the, the sheep head, the sheep head, you know, the, the freshwater drum, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that has been a big forage base the last two years now pushing up from the actual shad base that uh, was in the system. So mm -hmm. it all goes with that growth rate and the type of uh you know, uh, forage that they're chasing. I, what we've how, been big, how big can you get them there? I mean, what have you seen it through the ice? Upper twenties, uh, upper twenties for sure. Oh, okay. it is, I wouldn't say that this, uh, you know, body, the, the Lake Winnebago system is a, a trophy potential by, you know, any means uh, there are bigger fish in here. Um, you know, there's, there, there, there definitely are some uh, uh, quality fish in the system, but you're not going to get that size, that caliber that you would just a stones uh, throw away up at Dale's place up there in Sturgeon Bay. Yeah. Cool. Just remember to, to tune in right now and ask questions and you could win. So that's a good time to start asking questions. That's awesome. Hey, I did want to ask both of you guys. It, it seems like uh, when using rattle baits, uh, especially spoons, that there's a cadence that really works with rattles. And it seems like some guys can, and gals can perform magic with these baits and other people struggle with it. So, bro, uh, talk to me a little bit about your jig stroke when you're using like a buckshot. 
And uh, Kyle, same thing. I mean, what, what what does the jig stroke look like for you guys? Well, I like to uh, start with a sweep, but not ripping it unless the fish are in that mood. If you got the right pressure system to right everything, then you could rip it and they have to catch it. But just to get their attention to draw them over. If I'm in a murky lake or even in a clear lake, it's more subtle. Like Leech Lake's gin clear and they'll swim right up there and just subtle movements. And you got to make them stop it. So you're getting it, just keep moving it and they, they want to look at it and they don't have hands. So they got to grab it. And so that's kind of what I do. Yeah. How about you, Kyle? Well, you know, I mean, uh, I like to call it, as I kind of alluded to before, the, the flurry, flee, and give up uh, type. You know, I'm I'm ripping these uh, uh, jig and wraps or pup minnows or spoons, depending on, you know, what I'm utilizing, just with a hard vibration, trying to call those fish in, just playing with that lateral line and, you know, just, just playing with those fish. And as I start, you know, if I'm lucky enough to bring some fish in and I'm getting some marks, you know, I'm going to slowly start popping, uh, you know, that rod up, slowly start popping up, making it chase Sometimes giving up at the top, if they're not committing, going right back down, starting all over again. But especially when we start fishing these schools around here, um, you know, uh, by me here, um, they're definitely, uh, you know, if, if I'll have one mark, you know, or two marks or something like that, I'll play with them for a while. Playing with them for a while to get that slurry going. And, uh, you know, that, that slurry will bring in more fish because it's that, that feeding frenzy, you know, I'm going to eat before you're going to eat type mentality. That's awesome. Hey, Kyle, I'd really like to thank you for stopping by College of Ice tonight. Uh, one, Thanks, of these days, one of these days, we're going to get you one of these mugs, huh, bro? Make sure you oh, get yeah. one. So, yeah, hey, what's hey good luck fishing. How, you, have you guys got any ice uh, local waters yet? We did uh, have a little skim, and then off it went in 70-degree weather. You know, I wasn't I wasn't uh, too uh, rough on that, but uh, you know, hey, uh, today we had uh, you know some uh, pretty uh, gnarly winds, forty five mile an hour gusts and whatnot. So it's it's coming, it's coming. We can't yeah, uh, just can't wait. So, well, Kyle, uh, good luck this season. Thanks again for stopping by. See you later, Thanks, guys. We'll see you. See you later. Hey, bro. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, before we bring in Brian uh, Stitka is uh, some of the hot new products out there, and really. A lot of anglers, especially ice anglers, go into the store and they try to decide, should I go to a hub style house or should I go to a flip over style house? And, and why should I go one way or the other? Talk a little bit about the Freebill Fortress. It's a hub style house. Talk about the benefits of a hub and, and specifically the benefits of that new design with the Freebill Fortress. Well, a hub style house is the maximum footprint for a smaller amount of money. But in that house, you get like the, the XL has 100 square feet. It, it's it's big. It's roomy. Uh, it's cool looking with the camel pattern. It's a, a sharp house, but it's strong. It doesn't just cave in with the wind because it has a kick out bottom. So it's super sturdy and has tremendous amount of room. You can you can have a square dance in there, but not that we're dancing in there, but you can, you can fish with your aqua view, your hummingbirds. You could have multiple holes and you never tangle. And the thing is... You know, the hub houses, when they first come out, I was a little bit of a skeptic because it's a light house. And you don't even have to tie this one down. Well, today you would have, but most of the time, <laughs> yeah. you, tie it down. you know, you could, you could just you could just drill in uh, one bolt and you're, you're set. But I hardly ever tie them down and I really don't have to. And they got the inner pocket, which folds out on the ice. So you don't have to set stuff on the ice if, if, uh, if you want to keep something off the ice. There's, there's those little corners you could set stuff. It's really a great design. It's yeah. it's over the top engineering, but I use flip style houses to run around. And, uh, but yeah. I, and Heather and I love, love these uh, Frable, uh, that with a hundred square feet of room, you could fight a sturgeon and land it in there and, and shoot stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. It's nice to have the room. The nice thing about that, the hub is it's the old style hubs. You pulled the sides out and it was like a cube and it came in at the bottom instead of and this now goes out so you get about a 50 55 percent more fishable space in the same design house and the nice thing is uh, i mean that xl you can fish yeah. four or five anglers in there and it, it weighs 47 pounds so it's it's small enough package you could throw it in the back of a small car or a you know a small suv you don't you don't need a large pickup truck or a trailer oh. to get them on the ice but then again i i'm still a real big fan of the flip over style house especially the one with sidestep technology on it. Oh, absolutely. You, you don't have to step over the heater out the front door. And Frable is the first in this technology. And the neat thing about it is 
you have that flat front wall. So you have the max yeah. amount of space. You have a great footprint to lay out your holes, to have a heater, to have your electronics. And, and if you got to go outside to grab something out of the truck, uh, you, you, you just go out your, your door. You're not, you're not imposing on your friend. And how many times have people caved in your hole as they're stepping out? It ain't going to happen. They'd have to go out of their way, cave in your hole, and then go out their door. It doesn't happen with a sidestep. They're well, awesome. Well, the nice thing about the sidestep, too, is you're not walking by your heater. I don't know how many pair of, of bibs I've burned over the years, but the nice thing is now you can slide out. Hey, we've had a couple questions on uh, size of fish holes. And I'm a big fan of for the average day. If I'm going out crappie fishing or walleye fishing or pike fishing, I'm 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 cutting an eight inch hole. I like the six inch when I'm fishing more of the directed at pan fish, but and then ten inch obviously if you're targeting big uh, big pike and lake trout and stuff. But what size are you using most often? Great, great question, Michelle. Uh, I was just going to say I, a lot of times I'm running and gunning. And I got razor now. I could use a four inch bit to find fish dropping cameras, just drilling that hole. And yeah. you screw the chuck, throw in an eight, and you're set. But if, if I'm going to fish for bluegills, crappies, perch, a six inch hole. And now these, these drill bits ain't that big. You could have multiple drill bits. And when I have kids around, if you got kids, a six inch hole is plenty. I've pulled up 29, 30 inch walleyes out of the hole. You just got to tip that submarine up. And then once you get it going, they almost <laughs> jump out of the, the, the ice. But, but they, they'll lose their boot down that hole. And I've seen that before where their foot goes down, but they come up without a boot. Well, that's that's kind of a hard day for them so that it's game over, you know. So a six-inch hole, if there's kids around, it's just a way to go. But I'm telling you, a, the Razor has micro stuff, so you could, you could use a little bit of everything. Yeah, the nice thing too about going electric is that uh, you know you don't have the pain of gas and mixing, and you don't have to worry about it spilling on the back of the vehicle and, and yeah. stuff like that. And that Razor Scout, I mean, it thing weighs you know a couple of pounds, and it's so easy to move around and so powerful. So it's it's, it's kind of fun. So hey, uh, we've got Brian Stitka with uh, Fleet Farm uh, in the queue. I'd like to bring Brian up. He's been the uh, tackle buyer for Fleet Farm for oh decades now, oh, and man. I really wanted to talk to him, bro, about you know really some of the trends in fishing. So, Kai, go ahead and bring Brian in. Brian, how are you? There he is. How are you doing? Are you doing? Hey, good. Good to see you. Good to see you. I suspect you were out in the deer woods this weekend. Did you uh, see anything? I did not see anything, and today was too windy, so I stayed home. Oh, uh, <laughs> awesome. So, Brian, uh, on Tuesday night, my wife shocked me at dinner. She said, would you take me deer hunting? Saturday afternoon, a big 10-point walked by us at 50 yards, and she got her first deer this weekend. So, un unbelievable, unbelievable. So, it's it really kind of cool. So, hey, I wanted to talk to you about trends in ice fishing. I know you've been a tackle buyer for Fleet Farm, and Fleet Farm has done such a great job in making sure that the tackle selection for the area is the right gear for the right time and a great color selections and that kind of stuff. But how do you kind of take us through the process? How do you determine what to buy and what to carry in your individual stores? I think there's a lot of different factors that go into it. Um, first of all, we partner up with a lot of good suppliers like Frable, and we really rely on guys like Bro and your pro staff and the information your sales reps bring back to us. Um, a lot of us buyers back in the office are users ourselves, and we also, um, some of my best friends all hunt and fish, and they're not afraid to tell me what's going on in a good way and in a bad way, and you just absorb as much information as you can and uh, make your decisions based on that. Um, I think too often we ignore what the fishermen tell us, and at the end of the day, they're going to make the buying decision and... Um, use what they want to use. So uh, it's important to listen. So yeah. Fraybill, was, Fraybill was really one of the first to come out with ice combos. Uh, do you remember back in the day when that came and what was your thought process when they came out? I was thinking about that this afternoon and when I started buying ice fishing, there wasn't too many combos over 1999. You know, maybe there was a St. Croix up there at $50 or so. And then everybody you know, looked at it and reached for the stars and, you know, the good news is that all these suppliers have really uh, stepped up the offering as far as what we can use to ice fish with. And the quality is so much better. And really, 
it, the experience becomes better because of that. We, you don't have as many issues. So, you know, better drags helps us catch more fish. Um, the introduction of the straight line, I personally got it, you know, it's been out for, I don't know, five, six years, seven years. I personally got in that about three years ago. Fish right now, I just love it. And, That's and awesome. That's and, great. And until you use it, you don't, you don't really see the difference. And, you know, the result is you do get, you do catch bigger fish with it because you're doing it the right way. So. Bro, you're not a fan of the straight line, are you? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, need it right there. I, I remember seeing fly reels on Mille Lacs th over 30 years ago and they're fishing walleyes and for no spin. So it's a long time coming, but I got, I got to say, the selection at uh, Mills, or it's, uh, I'm sorry, Fleet Farm. That's how long I've been there. I've been going to those stores, but at Fleet Farm is ginormous, and uh, it is a monstrous place. And if you can't find it in there, uh, it's not available probably because it's just giant. And uh, that's that's a lot of stuff to keep track of. Uh, the one thing that, bro, I won't buy an inline combo unless it has your name on it. <laughs> I love it. I, I love it. <laughs> so, Brian, uh, looking back, say, 20, 25 years and looking at today's tackle, I mean, what are the biggest changes that you've seen in, in the gear that ice fishermen are using? Um, Technology is one, and we could talk about that all day long, so I'm going to skip over that one. Um, ice houses. Um, you know, the cool thing today is everybody is, you know, pimping them out like a car or a, a boat. They're putting the lights on and everything that makes it easier for them to fish with. And at yeah. the end of the day, it doesn't cost them that much money to do it. And the ice fishing fish, the guy or gal, they're gadget people to begin with. The more toys that you can find to put on that stuff, it seems like the more that they like. So, but it's good stuff too. I mean, uh, Otherwise, you got to bring a flashlight, and you know it's it's stuff like that. Um, ice augers, you know, back in the day, it was only gas augers. There were a couple of electrics out there, and then next was all the propane. And now the the big switch is all two electric. So I think there's still applications for each one, depending upon. You, know, you mentioned Dale before. Um, if I was fishing Sturgeon Bay, I'd probably still take a gas auger up there. Uh, but for the run and gun guys, and especially early in the year, the electric is lighter, the way to go. You're not going to spill any gas in your truck. Um, yeah. We talked about the combos and talk about lures. Uh, uh, tungsten um, made us all better fishermen. It was kind of funny. You know, one of the companies introduced tungsten for spring. I didn't think it really made any sense. But as the learning curve goes on, and fishermen fish different, they find different uses for it. Um, fishing line, yeah. I heard you guys talking about floral. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know anybody that doesn't use floral, at least for the leaders anymore today. And um, why wouldn't, you know, why wouldn't you? So there's been, there's been a lot of good changes, but I'd say mostly the, the better product that we have to offer from all these different suppliers mm -hmm. and just the great ideas that come out from, uh, people that people that fish. Hey, bro, I wanted to ask you a question, and, and Brian, I'd like you to kind of tune in us as well. But you know, twenty years ago, it was all lead, and now tungsten's taken over, bro. Uh, and when do you see lead being the better choice than tungsten? And when's tungsten a better choice than lead? Well, you know, tungsten is thirty percent uh, faster fall rate than lead, and there's times where you don't need to fall fast if if the fish are down there, but they're uh, not biting really good, you don't need to drop it fast anyway. And a lot of times I drop it halfway down and slowly bring it to them and try to get crappies to come up higher or, or get the perch to swim around when their fin pops up. Then you, then you, you could drop it in there. You got them. But tungsten is nice if you're fishing fast, deep, and you're just covering holes. But if you're on the spot, uh, I don't know. Let, let's pretty still, I'm, I'm fine with either, uh, be honest with you, because I don't need to drop it in like a mushroom cloud. Hey, Greg. Great, good to see you. Ryan, how about yourself? I mean, are you seeing a lot of uh, consumer acceptance of tungsten, uh, even at the higher price points? I would say, especially in the ice fishing that we do, and I think Bro hit on it. Uh, you know, those fish are only underneath you for so long. So mm -hmm. if you want to get back to them fast, tungsten's the way to go. And 
I, I think people realize today that the busier you can keep that school of fish, the longer that they stick around. So uh, that's awesome. I mean, yep. even the China. Hmm. Yeah. So um, where do you see, what do you see next coming around the corner? Anything uh, big that uh, is brewing behind the scenes? Uh, do you see anything in shelters or augers or baits or lines or anything along those lines? I'd say that, you know, the biggest one again is the electric and all the different carried a model or two and now there really isn't a auger uh, company that doesn't have one mm -hmm. um, and then just you know the lightweight of the portability um, yeah just makes it more fun and easier to get out so well awesome hey thank you for the great job you do as a fisherman uh it's awesome to go into a store and have what you need and uh so thank you uh and thanks for coming on tonight and thank you guys. And I just want to thank Bro for what he's done uh, for the industry in the past by going out and visiting all these locations and stuff. It really does make a difference to our My pleasure. I've, I've, I've enjoyed it. And I just, I love meeting people right where they live. You know, that's, it's so much fun. And, and I've, I've been doing it and I've been talking to you for over 20 years. So it's been great. Well, thanks. Thank you guys for inviting me. You have a great evening. Good awesome. luck. Richard. Good Be luck. Safe. Good luck. Thank you. Well, bro, uh, we've had a lot of comments tonight. We've got uh, we got to pick this uh, winner for the uh, for the Fravo Pies Pack, uh, including the mug and one hundred sixty five dollars worth of stuff. But if there was a question or two, uh, I, I saw I've tried to keep up with them. We kept uh, we've got had so many comments and so many checking in. But if if uh, there's a great question right here, I wanted to you know Jamie Siegel, what what weight tungsten do you recommend? Oh, I I. I, I like the heaviest thing I could find. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter if I'm going to use tungsten at all. I want some heavy. So I want something that's at least, you know, an, you know, not, not an eighth ounce, maybe a, a 16th at the most and sometimes 32nd, but you start getting into the super micro stuff. I, you know, it's, uh, it, that doesn't really matter anyway for me, but, uh, just heavy, heavy. And, and Tony asked the question, I was just going to lead into it. In terms of colors, what are you finding that are you, you know, the colors that you're turning to? Are you going to glows? Are you going to some of the phosphorescent type stuff? Or just the main colors? Where, where are you sitting on colors lately? That's a great question, Tony. Uh, I, I really like to start out with, uh, if, if I'm on a dark lake, sometimes I like glow, but I like dark colors, like purples, black, uh, something that that silhouettes and I'm, I like, I think silhouetting is just as important as sticking out like a neon ball, but like with the buckshot rattle spoon going to the, the light stick, it is so important to have, have glow now in some lakes like red Lake, Lake of the woods. I'm sure Winnebago would be a great thing. And then as far as months, when the fish are hot and heavy, UV draws them in from a distance and UV has proven itself in tournaments. So I think it's very important to remember UV glow, light sticks and and then sometimes simple natural colors work really well but darker and and it's all about you know getting above the fish not just right at them and silhouetting so that, that's a very important thing you know one of the things i've learned especially with the uh, lake commandos is uh is a lot of times a, a different color will make a difference but if you're all using the same exact bait lure color you're not going to find what's working best as fast so, so how do you handle that? I mean, are you putting your clients, are you putting them on with three or four different colors to start the day or how are you, how are you doing that? I get to cheat because with all of them, there's, they're all, they're all like experiment. No, I, I give them what worked yesterday and my line is the experimental line and I'm watching lures all day long and a great question too. And I, I hooked the middle through the nose, through the top of the nose down and snip the body off if I'm using a spoon. But if I'm using a live bait minnow, then I'll hook it through the back. And some tough times, use a dropper on your buckshot spoons. Just tie a little line with a little gamma katsu hook and, and hook the minnow through the back. And the, the spoon is moving, but the minnow's fighting it. And uh, the fish will come in. They they understand, you know, that's that's the that's the the light and that's the, the bait, so they know what to do. So, Brian, how often do you find in color changes? Uh, I mean, if you get if you got somebody using four different colors, I mean, uh, do you find one that's deadly that day that maybe not that was the hot bait uh, or not the hot bait the day before? 
Oh, absolutely. Sometimes it's it's not even color; it's barring. Like if if the walleyes are crunch and perch, and you have the 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 black bars on the buckshot, it's a big thing. And but uh, it, it, a lot of times it, it goes back to uh, depending on the body of water I'm on. If we always have our favorite, I have my favorites, but I gotta forget that I don't want a preconceived notion. I yeah. always start with every color because I, I've learned that the lakes are different every year, and I've seen it on leech where they want a uh, glow perch, they want gold perch. And then the next year we're killing them on pink. And then the following year, they don't touch that. They want something else or blue and glow. So it's always important to keep changing and don't get complacent. That's why I like to have a bunch of lines. And if I'm not guiding, I always have someone that wants to go. I just have to find people that won't, uh, have a my spot as their new favorite spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Hey, bro, we're running out of time, but I, I want to remind everybody that we're going to be on next Sunday, uh, the 22nd. Uh, we have a very special guest coming in on Sunday, uh, and you guys know him as KBD. It's Kevin Van Dam. He's a very famous uh, bass angler. Uh, you know, he's been bass angler of the year a number of times, but he's also an ice fisherman, and I'm really interested to ask him how he builds patterns on open water and how maybe that applies on ice as well. Super and, and, cool. Yeah. And we also got Chris Russell, uh, marketing director for Fraybill and Plano. He's going to come, uh, he's going to come on board. Looking forward to working with him. And he's a hardcore angler. He's a hardcore angler, salt or ice. The guy really goes after it. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a fun guy. I've been in the boat with him and uh, on the ice with him as well. So it's kind of cool. And we got Patrick White with Pass Pro Shop. So oh, yeah. Great guy. Hey, yeah. Hey, on behalf of Bro and myself, all of us at College of Ice, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, Bro and I are gonna back off the program here for just a second. We're gonna pick a winner for the Frabo Prize Pack. So a lucky winner. So please stick around for a couple minutes, and we'll, uh, we'll see who's the winner. All right. Like and share. Like and share. Great, uh, bro, uh, bro. Great information tonight. And uh, thanks so much, man. We'll uh, we'll see you next Tuesday or next Sunday. Thanks for joining us. Bye, guys. Hey guys, bro. Uh, we've uh, we've had a chance to select a winner, and uh, it's Jamie Siegel. I'd like to thank Jamie. He was very active Jamie. tonight on the All show. Right. Way to go! Congratulations, you're the winner. And everybody, remember: be safe when you're going on early ice. Safety, safety. Remember everything we said in the past episodes. That's awesome, Jamie. Just give us, uh, send us, uh, reach out via private message. Send us your address. And we'll pass it on to the guys at Fraybill. We'll get you a new thing. But, hey, everybody, thanks again for tuning in tonight. And uh, really uh, play it safe in the coming weeks. And uh, we're looking forward to talking ice twice a week going forward, uh, starting at the uh, a week from uh, this week. Bro, have a great week. We'll talk to you uh, as soon as I get back from Montana, man. Awesome. All right. Thanks for watching this week's College of Ice. Stay tuned for all new episodes coming up.